Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continuing on our discussion on the, uh, the Hinduism and temple building and architecture and we have ended our discussion in the ground plan for the Garvagrihas. Now the other thing about the ground plan here is that there are the cardinal direction for like example north, east, south and west they are there they play a very important part of this ground plan and then of course there are also the other four direction like northeast and southwest and so on so altogether there are eight directions those we find to be uh, very important in the this ground plan as well as in the hindu idea of the universe so in other words this entire ground plan actually comes to represent or to be a metaphor of the hindu cosmos so you know uh, so in a way that I mean even though it is a small square structure in which the deity figure is installed at the center of it, but this is this small structure is actually a metaphor of the entire universe in the uh, Hindu belief. So that is the reason this uh, particular uh, images they hold uh, or like I mean this particular ground plan that, that we find to be uh, prevalent in many Hindu temples in the in uh, of course in the north and in the western part and in the eastern part of India but also in the south but um, this this is something that that we find to be um, central part of um, how the Garvagrihas or the main the sanctum sanctorum is constructed. Now if you see the elevation there are two important things that that comes here. So one is this axis mundi or this particular this vertical growth that we find and that starts from this particular area what we understand as this uh, place which is dedicated to Brahma. So this is this place from which we say the axis mundi come uh, which uh, the axis mundi rises and that actually goes uh, on the top of the temple tower. So there is a temple tower as we know that I mean in all the Hindu temples and in the temple tower we do not really see there is a particular pillar which is rising at the at the center of it but this is is more like a abstracted or a metaphorical axis mundi. So axis mundi is something that also is there if we remember that this, this particular idea was also there in the Buddhist stupas in which that, that there were those three umbrellas and the top of the stupa which also suggests this axis mundi which relates to the relic of Buddha and here what we find that there is this symbolic axis mundi which relates to the image of the deity which is uh, constructed here and with which it, it also connects to the shikhara or the, to, the apex of the temple structure on the top of it. Now what is important here is also that I mean it is not uh, in one hand this is this axis mundi this symbolic axis mundi and the only way the only tangible part or only the material part of this axis mundi is this particular uh, corbelled stone that is placed on the top of the shikhara or the top of this superstructure. So this is the temple structure or this sanctum sanctorum that I have already mentioned. So this is the vertical elevation. So as you you can see that this is square and this is also square the ground plan as well as the vertical elevation both are square and then on the top of it is the equal uh, you know like I mean the equal uh, length or like the equal dimension we can find that is used here as part of this superstructure on the top of it which is called the shikhara. Now on the top of the shikhara we have this corbelled stone uh, that is called the amalaka and amalaka is this corbelled stone which, which marks the space of this axis mundi and on the top of that we usually find there is a kalasha or like I mean this, this finial. The kalasha is something that is also a marker of life 
and that is the reason the idea of creation that that starts with this god figures or the goddess figures and they being the center of the universe they are uh, related to creation and everything else and then it also relates to this particular kalasha or this kalasha which which is uh, you know used in most of the uh, hindu rituals starting with the rituals for birth to marriage to death and everything else so that is that is something we find that i mean how all these symbols are brought together to suggest that what all are important in the in the hindu belief system now the other thing that i mean we can think about in terms of the superstructure and how the superstructure also relates to something else in nature and that is the mountain forms so there is this vertical growth of this superstructure and if we can think about it they also relates to the triangular mountains for example himalaya or kailasha as those mountains are believed to be the abode of the gods and then there is also the, in the hindu belief it has been considered that there is mount meru this this another uh, symbolic uh, mountain uh, which 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 is uh, not there only in hindu hindu belief but also there in the jain belief as well and uh, so the mount meru is also considered to be the center of the universe and which is the tallest mountain of all so this the temples which are also considered to be the abode of gods the elevation of the temples are also something they are compared to mount meru so that's the reason the temple structures we usually see in uh, in in central as well as in the northern india that they usually rise from the ba base to this uh, you know to the to the amlaka so this vertical growth in one hand it it has to do with this axis mundi and the other hand it also has to do with uh, how uh, mount meru is symbolized by this so from there if we see that how this this temple building practices they have been manifested in some of these early sites then this is one of the place in which we find this is the bitargao temple and this is near the city of kanpur and uh, it it comes from 5th century in uttar pradesh and here we this is also a temple which is built during this gupta period like the one we have uh, seen in the cave temple at udayagiri in madhya pradesh now unlike the cave temple or the one which is uh, made from um, you know from the living rock structures what we see here different is the entire temple is built out of bricks so from there what we see that the, this is this is a place i mean in in uttar pradesh we know that i mean these are the plains the gangetic plains where we do not really have that kind of rock structures but there is plain land in abundance and then there is also the river clay which can be utilized for making bricks that is the reason we also have seen as we have already discussed in the week on harappan um, you know the harappan cities the indus valley sites and so on how the river the areas around the river that uh, practiced and they they sort of mastered the skill of making bricks so this this particular practice of making bricks in the 5th century should not come as a surprise that how it can also be seen as some ways a continuation of some of the practices those were prevalent in the indus valley times now what we see here is this particular temple the garbhagriha of this temple it it definitely has also this particular this uh, vastu purusha mandala ground plan in which this square ground plan is um, you know considered and then on the top of that we also have this this is the base and then we have the superstructure uh, on that on the top of it so sometimes we find that i mean in the uh, as as it had uh, started being built sometimes we find that the superstructure actually goes much beyond than the base and that started happening in the uh, times when the uh, terminologies the ideas and the materials elements those are used in the temple architecture got more and more complex now the other thing that we also find here to be very interesting are the repetition of certain motifs so for example if we see there the particular shikhara and of course i mean we see that in the base as well but i mean i'll just give an example of the shikhara that how there are those cells or the niche like the small small shells which are uh, the cells which are which are uh, repeated all along in this uh, shikhara and the entire shikhara is divided into this 
horizontal registers. So, this this particular ways in which these parallel lines they sort of like I mean make this repetitive uh, gesture in on this on this architectural um, structures and then on if the, this is the parallel lines and then in each register we have the repetition of this initial like uh, features right. And in some cases we find that I mean there are uh, the small replicas of the entire temple or like the entire shikara those are also placed here as part of this in this horizontal uh, panels. So, why this particular kind of replication that takes place in these structures? So, in one hand we find that how this also adds to the, the way in which we have uh, considered the uh, this is a palace like structure. So, the palace cannot be unadorned. So, the kind of ornamentation those are associated with uh, beautifying a particular structure that is something that is here. But more importantly what we also find here is that I mean all this uh, particular uh, motifs or this units of ornamentation they are not really out of context. So, what I try to say with that is that I mean how this uh, particular uh, you know this units they actually resemble the entire temple and they multiply, uh, they, they multiply with uh, in the horizontal plane as well as in the vertical plane. So, you know in other words this is a kind of growth that is symbolized in these structures which is also discussed in the Hindu philosophy that I mean how everything comes from this one particular unit and then like I mean the multiplicity that that sort of like I mean you know it, it gets into the multiple forms and the multiplicity is practiced through that. So, and then at the same time it has this exponential growth the how these units can multi replicate and they, they can go they can have this exponential growth, but at the same time all these growths are sort of like I mean uh, you know they, they come back to this one particular structure that is the temple or they all of them this they sort of like I mean come back to the creator and that is the reason all this growth and everything they are also limited to the structure of the temple. So, in one way this is the unity on the other hand this is also this this uh, exponential replication of the forms both this opposing ideas are brought together in this temple structures. Now, with time we also find that there have been um, uh, projections and additions in the temple structures. For example, if we see this particular uh, area. So, this is an image of uh, the Bhitargao temple uh, from, from the 19th century from the late 19th century 1878 and which shows the earlier structure and this is the structure which is uh, renovated by ASI and now the temple looks like this. And so, here what we find that there is this projection which sort of like I mean which uh, marks the entrance porch. So, entrance porch is the area through which the devotees will go inside the temple and that is the reason there is a projection for to attract the attention of the devotees at the same time if the devotees are waiting at this entrance porch and then they go inside it. So, it uh, the way the practices around the temple started getting more and more complex we see the architecture and the sculpture they also started getting more and more complex with time and this is an example of that. Another example will also be uh, another example of this multiplication we can see that will be from um, you know the another temple which is also one of the early temples and that is the Dashavatara temple from Deogar in UP which is uh, which is again in the Gangetic plain. And so, both the Dashavatara temple I mean uh, well like I mean the Dashavatara temple we can see that there is a use of um, you know the local sandstone something that we have uh, on and on uh, sort of stressed on how there are those locally available resources and they have been uh, utilized by the artisans, sculptors, architects and so on and for, for making this uh, magnificent structures. So, along with the Dashavatara temple in Deogar, the Bhitargao temple is considered to be some of the earliest surviving Hindu temples in uh, in the uh, in the Indian subcontinent and especially the Bhitargao temple being perhaps the earliest surviving brick temple in the Indian subcontinent. 
Now what we find here this idea of the replication and this idea of the cardinal directions and everything else they come alive in this the temple of uh, Deogar. So what we have here there is this square uh, sanctum sanctorum or the Garvagriha and on the top of that we have the Shikhara and then of course we have the amalaka and the finial or this kalasha all those structures or all those characteristic features that we have explained so far all of them are present in this temple in this De in in deogar now the other thing that we also find that i mean the temple is situated on a high platform and it's really high so this this particular high platform or jagati that is something that we have already discussed in the buddhist context in the jaina context in which we have have seen that how the sacred structures are not really placed on the regular ground with all of us but they are usually placed on a higher platform to show that I mean their divine connections. So here we see that there is this high platform which is also which also has a square uh, you know uh, ground plan and in this square ground plan we also have this stairways which marks each cardinal direction. So this this cardinal direction, this idea of the cardinal direction, which is also ingrained in this architecture building in in the Hindu context. I mean, as well as we can also say that the same thing about the Buddhist and the Jain context as well. Now we see that this cardinal direction and all the other details of this, um, you know, the, the the ground plan and the elevation of the temple, all of them they come together here. Now the other thing that we also see that how this uh, that that uh, complexity of the temple. That, that grew further and further. So here if in the cardinal direction we have the staircases and in each of the corners like the, uh, the northeast, south, west and like I mean so on in those ones what we find there is how um, there are four uh, subsidiary shrines which are added to there and if you see the shrines very closely they are actually miniature replicas of the one that is there at the center. So how this particular idea of replication that is not something just for ornamentation uh, I mean of course ornamentation is never out of context but how this this particular way in which we see that the temple main temple had almost like replicated itself in the other four directions that is something that talks about this idea of the Hindu cosmos that from the creator how there are multiple units that that sort of like I mean spring out. So these are some of the ways in which we find how this complex philosophical thoughts and this, this abstracted ideas they were actually materialized by the use of stone and brick and of course um, with this very intricate carving. Now talking about the carving we, we cannot ignore that some of the carvings that, that is there featured in this uh, Dashavatara temple. So the, the name Dashavatara comes from um, um, Lord Vishnu's avatars or like I mean the 10 avatars or incarnations of Lord Vishnu and here we find that there is a m image of um, this monumental image of Lord Vishnu that is there in um, that is there in the exterior wall of this uh, temple complex that the Avatara temple complex and in which we find that this carved image from sandstone the, in this one we find there is a lower register in which there is a uh, dispute between the, the gods perhaps with the asuras that takes place and perhaps it has its um, you know its, its reference towards the churning of the ocean or the samudra manthana and then on the top register we find that uh, Vishnu or um, he is shown here on the coils of the uh, shesha or the shesha shayana. So that is particularly um, um, important here as how what we see that I mean how uh, Vishnu is, is uh, with all his iconographical attributes we find that I mean how he is uh, you know been shown here on the coils of this shesha naga. And then we also see that there are references about how from Vishnu's navel um, a lotus came out and through wi from which like I mean Brahma uh, came into being. So here we see the image of Brahma and then of course that I mean the figure who is riding an elephant will be Indra and then the other prime figures we will find them to be uh, around this area. 
Now the very interesting part of Hinduism is that we find that whoever uh, as, as we have already indicated that, that whoever believes in one particular god they, or goddess, they will consider that how the, all the other gods and goddesses will be uh, uh, bowing to them or like I mean uh, how all the other gods and goddesses will uh, uh, accept the supremacy of this particular figure. So, if we see that I mean in this particular case how uh, the image of Vishnu has given such priority, then in the other depictions we find that how um, Shiva has given such kind of treatment. Now, if we think that I mean what happened to the continuation uh, of, of this rock cut structures that if we think that with the construction of such kind of temples like the ones which are created from the blocks of sandstone or with, with the bricks, if this is a new kind of practice if we think and that is how the rock structures were abandoned that will perhaps not be true to say. because. During this time period and even later we find that I mean there have been other constructions for example, we have this elephanta uh, caves near Mumbai where we have that I mean this, this living rock cut structures and for example, here we in the left side of the screen we have the we have this mighty entrance porch towards this cave temple of um, Elephanta and um, that, that is something that also reminds us uh, of, of the Karle and Bhaja caves in, in Maharashtra as well. And then as we have already discussed that this, this making of this kind of cave temples or this rock cut architecture continued at least until 10th or 11th century given the geographical locations for example, in Elora and so on. So, the places which are mostly in the plains and so and uh, you know in the river and land and so on, there perhaps there, th there are more of these practices of making temples with brick or individual stone blocks. Where, whereas, the places where we find this living rocks are there, so there was already this tendency of making the rock cut structures. And in the, in, in the interior of this rock cut uh, temple of Elephanta or this rock cut cave temple, we find that there is uh, that there are a number of these sculptures and uh, this one of the most important sculpture will perhaps be that the manifestation of Shiva as which is also known as Trimurti, but it is basically like how there are three forms of Shiva they are depicted in one form. So, what we have here in this bust form uh, in this one as we can see at the center uh, of, of the uh, image in right. So, there we have that I mean there are three faces of Lord Shiva which are shown here in the in the left side which will be in the right side of the screen there is Vamadeva or Parvati. Who, um, uh, who shows the feminine side of Shiva and she is shown as graceful, she is smiling and um, she and this is also something that relates to this idea of Ardhanarishwara which we, we will address that uh, later in this in this week. And then in the left side or um, in the in the right side of Shiva's uh, you know this bust, what we find there is a manifestation of Rudra Deva or the fierce form of Shiva. So, he is shown here with this bulging eyes as well as his um, you know his very expressive lips and, and perhaps with fangs as well. So, it, it sort of like I mean shows a very different aspect of Shiva and between this two this fierce form and the feminine form we find that I mean there is the pacific form and who is considered to be uh, you know the supreme the form of a yogi who is not bothered by any other um, um, you know any other events or anything which is which is happening in the outside world or the material world and he is depicted in the supreme state of meditation. So, something that we find that how this this complex ideas which have been spoken about which have have been um, you know sort of like I mean sang in the hymns of Vedas and so on, they come alive in the way in which the stones are carved, they come alive in the hands of the artisans. 
now from there if we go back a little bit on the on the uh, ways in which the temples are constructed then uh, we we see that i mean at least from 6th century from 7th century and so on uh, odisha actually became uh, a very important site in which a uh, number of temple building activities have taken place and between 7th and 12th century we find uh, there was a high degree of involvement at the same time advancement of in making temples in various sites of Odisha. Now the temple city or the old city of Bhubaneswar is one of the prime centers in which we find temples from different time periods. So some of the early temples in Bhubaneswar like the one that we have on screen that is Parashurameshwara for a temple and that, that comes from 7th century in Odisha and this is also a sandstone uh, structure that we find here and what is very interesting is that we see that there is a um, there is of course this uh, particular Garvagriha that we have here how this particular squarish ground plan uh, this this structure with the squarish ground plan that that houses the deity and on the top of that we have the superstructure and then on the top of the superstructure we have the amalaka and then the finial on the top of it and of course we see a, a flag on the top of the finial here as well now apart from this elements what we see here really interesting is this particular addition that there is an addition of a you know a rectangular space a rectangular covered space that is there that is now adjoined to this uh, main sanctum sanctorum or the garvagriha so what is this so this is a space which is called mandapa or the ceremonial hall and the ceremonial hall is something which gives shelter to the devotees so as we have already discussed that with time when the the practices became more and more complex in which we find that usually not all the devotees would be allowed to go inside the garvagriha because garvagriha is also something that is considered to be um, an area which should not be disturbed all the time and that is the reason we find that there is a prevalence of the priest figures the priests are the ones they will be going in the garbhagriha and all the audience the general audience the devotees they will stay in the outer areas of this garbhagriha so for them to have a shelter and also to have like musical performances or different kind of ceremonial rituals to take place at the site of the temple we find that i mean this this new uh, structure of mandapa that came into existence now of course now when we see the temples we see that i mean this mandapa is there in most of the temples but this is these are some of the early examples in which we know that it how it started now since this is a, almost a closed structure that we have only like three doors which which allows people to go inside this structure and then we have some of the areas for ventilation here as well as here so that uh, there is ample amount of air that that passes through these places so that people are not suffocated and this this as i have already mentioned that uh, there are uh, decorations or ornamentations in the exterior walls of the temple complexes and here again we can see how the entire shikhara is divided into these horizontal registers and then there are those vertical projections we see here as well so the registers are dividing the entire surface in this horizontal uh, you know uh, shapes uh, or like i mean these lines and then there are the vertical projections which sort of like I mean come out of the main superstructure and this these are some of the ways in which we find how this uh, the complexity in the rituals complexity in the belief they are also expressed in the complexity of the form the structure and as I have already mentioned that I mean how the idea of this replication this infinite replication that 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 appears to be uh, at the at the center of Hindu belief system so those are the prime characteristic features that we find uh, that they came uh, alive in the early stages of Hindu architecture